Tim and welcome to the programme. Well, for the last two weeks, relatives of the 239 people on board flight MH370 have had little information as to what's happened to their loved ones. Well, as the search continues, centering around a sighting of debris over 2,000 kilometres of Western Australia, there's little new information emerging. Over the next hour, we're going to speak to guests in Kuala Lumpur, in Washington and also in Arizona. Plus, in a week which has seen tit-for-tat sanctions imposed in Russia and the US over the crisis in Crimea, we've brought together a group of Russians to ask if they're proud to be Russian. We're here live for the next 50 minutes. All of our contact details will be on screen throughout the programme. Good to have your company here on World Have Your Say. Over the next hour, we're going to be talking about that missing plane. If you want to get in touch with us, facebook.com forward slash World Have Your Say is a very good way to do it. All of your comments will come to me here on my tablet and I will weave them into the conversation and put them to the guests who join us. But to give you a flavour of the number of comments that are coming into us about the situation in Crimea, in Ukraine, and particularly from Russians, this video came into us from Odessa. Of Odessa. I think the main mistake made by Western media, considering the situation with the Crimea, is starting to discuss it without analyzing the causes that led to it. Because the main reason for Crimea to escape from Ukraine were the victory of Nazi Corp in Ukraine, full not legitimateness of all power structures, transcendent level of violence in Kyiv and other Ukrainian cities, illegal gangs roaming with semi automatic rifles in Ukrainian cities, and marauding. The very first law proposed after the victory of the Nazi oligarchy COP was uh, the prohibition of Russian language and political repressions. In addition, the Nazis promised Crimeans to come to the Crimea and start massacring. No surprise that in these circumstances the people of Crimea, where Russian frames are strong, began to form militias and subsequently called for a referendum. I must say that uh, dissatisfaction with the current situation in Ukraine is extremely strong not only in Crimea but throughout all southeast of Ukraine in such cities as Donetsk, Lugansk, Odessa, Nikolaev where tens of thousands of citizens organized rallies, marches against illegal Ukrainian Nazi junta. Well, that was Vladimir in Odessa in Ukraine who got in touch with us via WhatsApp. If you want to do the same, all of our contact details for WhatsApp are on our Facebook page. And we'll be talking to more Russians later in the programme. But first of all, let's turn our attention to the latest on that missing plane. Such a lack of information for all of the relatives who've been waiting for 14 days now for more information. Let's cross over now to Kuala Lumpur and speak to Satish Cheney, who's a freelance reporter from Singapore, who's in Kuala Lumpur. And we spoke to you this time last week. Satish, welcome back to World Have Your Say. You've been there the whole time, the whole 14 days. You've been there with the relatives. Just give us a sense of how they're bearing up. Well, actually, last night I spoke to some of the uh, Malaysian family members and relatives at a nearby hotel. And um, you could actually tell, you know, the sense of defeat mixed with anguish in their expressions. Um, some of them whom I spoke to, they said uh, they're slowly accepting that uh, the inevitable that the passengers uh, may probably may not be alive. Uh, one of them, Mr. Hamid Amran, um, whose child, uh, whose son uh, was on the missing plane, uh, he said a lot of these briefings that are being given by the Malaysian government, uh, he described them as being rather useless. And he rather sarcastically said that the only thing he has learned is that the Malaysian military's radar systems are probably not good enough to protect their own airspace. Do they have any faith in anything they're being told? Obviously, in the last few days, attention has switched to a, to a different location. Do they feel like they believe anything they're being told at all? Well, I don't think so. Uh, from all the family members I've spoken to directly, uh, as well as over the phone, uh, you can hear the sense of frustration growing each day and also the skepticism and is together with all the media reports that are coming out as well, uh, mixed with what they're hearing from their own Malaysian government officials. There's a lot of confusion going on. And I think this growing distrust, it's, it's yeah, well, it's certainly growing. And I think 
the only way that the uh, Malaysian government can help these relatives is to provide perhaps a bit more information. But at the same time, a lot of critics have said, uh, uh, sorry, a lot of people have, in Malaysia have said that uh, critics have been harsh on the Malaysians because there is no information apparently to share. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, if you ask me. You talk about that information, lack of information, Satish, and this is the problem with this whole story. Let's bring in uh, Bill Waldock, who is Professor of Safety Science and also Crash Lab Director at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona. Professor Waldock, welcome to World Have Your Say. Information is the massive problem here. There just isn't any, is there, at the moment? Well, right now, there's not any to be had. Um, until the search aircraft and uh, the, the surface vessels that they're putting into the area find something, we're not going to know what that object is that they're looking for and whether or not it's part of the aircraft that's missing. Do you think it ever will be found? People keep contacting us from across the world saying it's been two weeks in this high-tech age. How can an airliner just disappear? Has it got to the stage where we have to contemplate that we may never know what happened, we may never find any debris? Well, the, the, the first part of that question is uh, people forget this is a huge planet. Uh, we are so... Uh, oriented now toward our, our technical capabilities, our technology that we have available. The very fact that I'm talking to you from across an ocean real time is, is fantastic. But it also tends to reduce the scale in which we see the world. And once you've been out over, over deep ocean, uh, a thousand miles away from any land, you start realizing just how big this planet is. And uh, when you're looking for something that, that's relatively small in comparison, uh, it takes time to find it, and I'm hopeful we're going to find this aircraft. Uh, whether or not this particular debris comes from it, it doesn't mean that the we're not going to find some other debris that comes from it uh, down the road. So what can be done right now? There's, there's planes, there's boats out there looking, trying to find debris, obviously radars being used. Do you feel that so far... The Malaysian authorities have obviously been criticised. Do you feel they were a little bit slow in the way they dealt with this investigation? Well, from what I saw, uh, in terms of the immediate response, uh, the Malaysian government seemed to do what was necessary. Uh, I've had a lot of experience with search and rescue as well as accident investigation, and it looked like they, uh, they responded pr in a pretty standard way. Um, they had what they thought was the first last known position of the aircraft near where the transponder went dark, uh, the first search assets looked in that direction, and then you widen out the search areas, you don't find anything. The current search, I have to say, the Australians uh, are doing a magnificent job. Uh, the United States is doing a magnificent job in assisting. And as this search area is examined, uh, I'm hopeful they'll find whatever those satellites saw. The other aspect is I know that several other satellites are being retasked uh, to look at the same area, and some of these have much better imaging capability for the surface from orbit. Professor Walder, I want to pull up this comment um, from Michael Wolfe. He wrote on the a column on the Guardian's website with the heading MH370 story is the new anti-journalism, all data, no real facts endless theories. He says, journalism exists to provide information, but what's really compelling is a lack of information, or what is more particularly being called an absence of empirical data. Would you agree with that, Professor Waldock, that we live in this age of 24-hour news, people demand information all the time, we've talked about that lack of information. Do you think the media's role in this has, has caused greater pain and greater difficulty to some of those relatives? Well, I, I don't know if I'd say that. I, I think some organiza news organizations are maybe a little bit more zealous in their prosecution of this. Uh, but one of the things that's an issue here is the fact that we don't really know where the airplane is. And that takes a laborious, long process sometimes. Um, it, the, the idea that we want to know all the facts right now, there are some facts that are known. We know the aircraft is missing. We know that the transponder and uh, the ACAR system stopped before the aircraft went missing. We know there was a last communication from the aircraft. So uh, we know broadly that the aircraft probably flew for seven hours. It's not an absolute fact, but it's close enough to a fact where we're using that um, 
as an aid. We've seen some pretty, some I'd call it innovative technology applied to trying to figure out where this airplane is. The use of the ACARS transmission system, the pings that you heard about, to estimate the area where the airplane is, that system was never designed to do that. And yet we seem to be able to at least understand that the airplane probably flew uh, through its entire fuel endurance. So there are some things that we know as fact, but there's a lot more that we don't know as fact, and, and we really can't unless we find the airplane. Professor Waldock, before I introduce another guest into our conversation, people are obviously watching around the world and getting in touch with us. Ryan is listening to us and has posted this question on Facebook just now, asking you to answer it. How long would it take for someone to disable the GPS tracking for the plane? Is it a matter of moments? Uh, well, there actually isn't any GPS tracking. Uh, what that aircraft is equipped with, uh, it does have an internal GPS navigation system, but that isn't transmitted. Uh, what was uh, what was what stopped working? Because that's one of those factoids that we're not still exactly sure how it happened. But the transponder is a radio frequency beacon that the airplane sends to air traffic control uh, that shows up on their radar and it gives a, a lot of information about the aircraft's altitude, airspeed, direction, uh, and condition. Uh, that stopped. We know that. Why it stopped? Uh, it's probably the best case that somebody turned it off. That's the easiest solution. Uh, there are other ways it could have stopped, but the aircraft has several different backup systems uh, which would kick in, all of which would essentially do the same thing. Uh, well, so let, me, let me introduce you to another guest who's here to join our conversation. John Ostrower is a Wall Street Journal reporter in Washington, D.C. John, welcome to World Have Your Say. We've been talking a little bit about the response of the Malaysian airlines and, and, and the Malaysian government response to this missing aeroplane. Many people getting in touch with us from across the world, just totally unable to understand how something can disappear for 14 days. You yourself, you've written quite a lot, which has been critical of that response. Well, certainly what we have reported on over the last two weeks has really been uh, our attempt to understand how things unfolded over that first week of the, in the investigation. Uh, from the first Saturday when the aircraft went missing, all the way through Prime Minister Najib's uh, comments essentially confirming uh, that the aircraft had continued flying and that there were these two north and south corridors where the aircraft was last spotted by the satellite. So what we've tried to really do is understand the process there. Certainly there have been those who have been critical of, of the Malaysian government's handling, most notably uh, the Chinese government. Uh, certainly in, in other circles there uh, has been similar criticism. So what we've tried to do is understand the pace of, of how decisions were made last week. In doing so, we, we think we've uh, been able to come up with a, uh, a timeline that explains a lot of the decision making and ultimately how last week unfolded. And we've been talking as well about the problems in, in communicating information. We pulled up a comment uh, just before you joined us about how the media in a 24-hour age is just trying to fill airtime with very few facts. Do you think the media has a real responsibility here to be careful about too much speculation? Well, I think uh, you note that there, is a, there has been a vacuum of information. And certainly when an air accident of any kind happens, everything starts with a blank slate. And certainly that tends to be the case for any large breaking news story, that you don't know uh, what you don't know, uh, quite literally. And when you begin that process from our perspective, understanding the context of the, the, both the uh, accident and the investigation. Uh, it's important to point out at this point, we don't know if there was an accident. Certainly no, we know the aircraft is missing, but how it's gonna be classified is still uh, up for grabs. But in that, uh, certainly, uh, we, what we have tried to do is un be factual and understand uh, the context around how this is, has uh, really unfolded. So starting on uh, day zero, for example, you, what you do in situations like this when there aren't answers quickly, and what we've seen in the subsequent two weeks, there haven't been answers on top of that, is you begin to paint a picture of tell us about the aircraft, tell us about the airline, tell us about what types of situations could be reasonably expected it, during the nor course of normal operations. So you use what you, what you know and you can say factually as a springboard for further reporting. Beyond that, obviously, as things have rolled on over the last two weeks, the list of things we don't know about this flight still continues to be just as long as the list of things we do know. 
John Ostrower, oh, Professor rather, Baldock, sorry, thank you so much. longer than the things we do now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us here on World Have Your Say. Well, we're going to take a quick break now and we'll carry on talking to Russians about whether they're proud to be Russian in light of what President Putin has done in the last few weeks in Crimea. Do stay with us. No, I, uh, I absolutely... Talking about it. Jim, point, but let me say something. Talking about it. Jim, point, but let me say something. Africa Business Report. No, I, uh, I absolutely... Talking about it. Jim, point, but let me say something. Welcome back to World Have Your Say. We're going to turn our attention now to the situation in Ukraine. We're going to be speaking to some Russians about their reaction to what President Putin has done over the last week. Let me introduce you to the guests who are here to join us. Anissa Nawe is a senior political correspondent for RT. You may know that better as Russia Today. She is in Moscow. We're also joined by Natalia Pelovina, who is co-founder of the 5th of December Opposition Political Party, also joining us from Moscow. And Vladimir Samarin is editor for photography magazine if I can put my teeth in in Moscow well first of all I want to pull up this video and get your response to it and um, Sergei sent us this video from Greece today the Russians seem to be celebrating they seem to believe that they have reclaimed what is theirs the Crimea and they are convinced in the righteousness of their government's actions but as they added another peninsula to their territory on the world map Russia lost a relationship that was built over centuries and I am not convinced that this result is one that should be celebrated by the Russian people. And that was Sergei, a Ukrainian in Greece. Let's put that uh, point, first of all, to Vladimir. What's happened in Crimea in the last week? Is that to be celebrated? Yes, uh, my uh, sincere idea, my sincere feeling is that uh, this is to be celebrated, what happened in Crimea uh, last week. I'm uh, really satisfied that uh, finally uh, the, this piece of Russian land uh, was incorporated back uh, into, let's say, the motherland Russia. So I think so. There, uh, there is a great uh, thing to celebrate for all Russian people. I know there are some people who uh, disagree. I know uh, different opinions, different views on the matter, but I'm sure for me, uh, this is a really great case to celebrate. Natalia, your reaction? God, what's happening is the worst tragedy um, imaginable. Um, not only Vladimir Putin is he violating international law, international pacts, uh, because he keep, keeps referring to UN right to self-determination, and there is no such nation or ethnic group as Crimeans. Uh, he's violating sovereignty of Ukraine. He is making Ukraine an enemy, as uh, Sergei just said in that video. Um, that relationship is lost, probably forever or for a very long time. He's putting economic strain on Russia, additional one, uh, because it will cost trillions to support that region. Uh, he is putting Russia in, in isolation globally. He is creating iron, iron curtain, which is already happening. We're, we're seeing sanctions, uh, you know, all all around us. You know, creating the iron the, the iron uh, curtain that was there in Soviet Union that we so hoped uh, we got away from, but that will never happen again. And he's creating possibility of real war and real bloodshed. So, am I celebrating? I'm doing the very much the opposite. This is a tragedy. What's going on, Vladimir? I can see you smiling as Natalia speaks to us. Have a conversation with her. Okay, uh, my idea is that uh, there were no international law or broken at all. Uh, Please broken explain, all. Vladimir, uh, which law was not broken? What, what, which uh, law was not broken? As far as we remember from Kosovo precedent, uh, international law allows a uh, population of a territory uh, to uh, there was vote an ethnic for group its involved, independence. Vladimir. This was a completely Sorry? different story. There was an ethnic group, and secondly, was any territory then created uh, as uh, was then added to any other uh, uh, sovereign state, which Russia is uh, doing with Crimea right now. Russia is grabbing the land that doesn't belong to it right now legally, and is running with uh, it. Is that what happened uh, in Kosovo? Legally, uh, legally, the land uh, was no, is not that what belonging happened? to Russia before. Is that what before? happened in Kosovo, Vladimir? Did anybody grab that land and run? Hang with on, it? Natalia. Let Vladimir respond, I just, and then I want to bring in Anissa. Go ahead, Vladimir. I, I, ju I just wonder why uh, some people do not respect uh, the opinion of uh, Crimean people. There was a referendum. Uh, whether you agree with it or not, it was a uh, event uh, that showed the opinion of vast majority of Crimean people to all the world. The way Russia went about it, Vladimir, was not peaceful, diplomatic 
nice way, okay? This was an aggressive uh, inter, inter, interference into what's going on in a different, in, in a sovereign state. Well, there was nothing uh, peaceful, was the nothing, nothing nice about it at all, nothing, nothing legal about it whatsoever. I do appreciate the fact that a lot of Russians in Crimea would like probably to be part of Russia. This could have been done differently. I'm sure there was a peaceful scenario that could have been played out. What happened instead is Vladimir Putin was so scared of what happened in Maidan and in Ukraine uh, recently with uh, with ousting of uh, Yanukovych, who is very much, uh, you know, his brother uh, in, in corruption and in, in how legal he runs the, his country or used to run his country. He decided to uh, take protective measures, the number one, um, for his own country. You know, he's he's on his way to building full building full blown uh, dictatorship in our country, in Russia. Number two, yes, he's punishing Ukraine. That, there's no question to me uh, to me about that. He's, he's, that's what he's doing right now. And well, Natalia, thirdly, yes. let, me, let me jump in. You'll be but, able to make your point in a moment. I want to bring in Anissa, but it's also worth saying many people are critical of the referendum in Crimea because there wasn't an option of keep things the same. There wasn't an option of no. It was either join the Russian Federation or get greater autonomy for Crimea. Much of the international criticism is the fact that there wasn't a keep the status quo. Let's bring in Anissa now, as I say, senior political correspondent for RT. Anissa, you've listened to this conversation so far. What would you like to add? Well, first of all, I just want to say that I don't know if I agree that many people in Crimea exactly are critical of the referendum. I think it's pretty clear uh, from either side that the majority of Sorry, people... Sorry, not critical in Crimea, join... the international criticism of well, the referendum. Big difference. You said in Crimea. Apologies. Uh, but I think in terms of of what the discussion, where the discussion was leading earlier, talking about international law, peaceful diplomacy. It's really uh, unfair, I think, to discuss what happened, the referendum in Crimea, without remembering what happened just a couple of weeks earlier in Kiev. If you're going to talk about international law uh, legality, you should talk about the government, how it came to power illegally, how it wasn't peaceful. Uh, what might have started as a peaceful protest certainly didn't end that way. And so uh, the, the debate Who becomes the when you start talking about the legality of the referendum, but not the legality of uh, the people running Ukraine and Kiev. Anastasia, who fired the bullets in Kiev? What's that? Who fired the bullets in Kiev? Was it not the government? There's certainly a lot of evidence, if you want to dig, that it's not that black and white, that it wasn't the government just shooting peaceful protesters. Anybody who wants to find that material has a way to do it. Um, and also, the United States criticizing this referendum in Crimea. I agree with you that it's a bad idea to compare with Kosovo because it was a different situation, although it did set a precedent. It's a different situation. I agree with that. But in terms of the violence in Kiev, it's very clear that it wasn't black and white, that it wasn't as simple as the government just shooting at the protesters, uh, and that this was a violent, violent protest. Uh, lots of things happened on Maidan. There's clear documentation of that. I had colleagues that were shot out. So to say that the government just came out and started shooting at the protesters is just not true. Well, we are discussing Crimea now, not Kiev. However, I really don't believe that snipers who shot at protesters It's impossible were... to discuss Crimea without discussing Kiev. Which, which I also mentioned uh, earlier, the fact that Putin's reaction in Crimea, uh, keeping in mind that if just a few years ago, he, and this is documented on video, he himself said, we're never claiming Crimea back because what's done is done. He said that himself only Natalia, I'm going ago. to jump in at this point. Anissa, Natalia, Vladimir, do stay with us. We've just got to take a quick break here on BBC World News. We'll carry on talking about this straight after Let's that. Head to Facebook if you want to add your thoughts. together Russians to get their take on President Putin's actions over Crimea. As the US and EU on one side and Russia on the other trade sanctions, what impact has the annexing of Crimea had on Russia? Welcome back to World Have Your Say.
Good to have you back with us here on World Have Your Say. We're still joined by our three guests, Anissa Nawe, who's a senior political correspondent for RT in Moscow, Natalia Pelovina, who's co-founder of the 5th of December Opposition Political Party in Moscow, and Vladimir Samarin, who's editor for a photography magazine in Moscow. Well, first of all, I want to pull up this comment and get your reaction to it. Tatiana posted on BBC Russian's V-Contact page. That's a bit like a, a Russian social network page like Facebook. And she says, by reuniting... Um, Russia, um, Putin has made us feel proud to be Russian again. It's not just about returning a piece of land, it's about gaining back love and respect to our motherland. I feel that we were given a chance to feel self-respect and pride for who we are and what we stand for. And Vladimir, I would say that's that's fairly reflective of a, a wide range of views coming out of Russia, saying they feel proud again. Is that something you identify with? Yes, I do. Uh, I feel uh, quite uh, the same feelings. Uh, for the first time uh, in uh, about uh, 23 years, I really feel uh, proud uh, of being Russian, of being a part of my country, of being a citizen of Russia. Uh, when the uh, Soviet Union disintegrated in uh, 1991, uh, I didn't feel uh, the three-color uh, three uh, Russian uh, new flag as a flag of my country, because uh, I had my military service in Soviet Union and my flag, you know, was red. But uh, now, after 23 years, uh, I, for the first time, I uh, have started to feel this flag as a flag of my country, uh, as my flag. So I'm also proud of what happened. Natalia, you obviously aren't proud of that yourself, but can you understand why some Russians may feel that pride? Well, the, the, the unfortunate thing is that uh, Putin has been sort of creating new Soviet Union out of Russia for a while now. And, and this, is, this is part of it. And a lot of people who were born in the Soviet Union, as we just heard Vladimir, uh, and raised perhaps in the Soviet Union, uh, do feel some nostalgia, and this feeds that nostalgia, of course. But this is very temporary, um, unfortunately, and this will not, not last. What will last, however, is the very dire economic situation, which is soon going to uh, happen in Russia. Um, I, I'll tell you, I was talking to my friend yesterday uh, here in Moscow. He owns small businesses, and he had to fire six people in this last week. Um, the, the, the ruble is dropping, the dollar is skyrocketing, and the rest of it. We're going to see you know, many, many really dire consequences um, in the very near future. And this is when people will forget how proud they are about the fact that Crimea is part of Russia again. This will, you know, it will eventually, that emotion will die out, the economic consequences and the rest of the consequences, consequences that Russia will see, such as pretty much the isolation from the rest of the civil world, um, are going to remain. And uh, unfortunately, nothing to be really happy about, not for very long anyway. Let's bring Natalia Tuzovskaya, who's a social media producer for BBC Russian. Natalia, welcome back to World Have You Say. Good to have Hi. you on the programme. We heard there from Vladimir about the pride. We heard from Natalia about the concerns for the economy in the future. Are those two views that, that you're very much hearing from your listeners? Absolutely, but uh, we should distinguish here uh, two basic trends because, you know, if, if you look at the trends overall Russia, the question about economic sanction only comes, comes out when we're talking about big cities. And what we have been noticing during the week that Moscow, St. Petersburg, Nizhny Novgorod, Kazan, uh, Krasnoyarsk, all the big cities of Russia, uh, there's just as much concern about uh, sanctions, economic sanctions, as uh, this overwhelming feeling of pride. So there are two big trends uh, there. Whereas, uh, across Russia, generally, the major one, of course, is about the pride and people being uh, very emotional and um, expressing themselves in really strong words uh, and feeling very high about it. Talking about that emotion, just give a, a sense to our, to our audience all around the world about why this is so important. What are they saying? That Does it make them feel like a global power again? Does it feel like Russia's on the up? What is it? It's everything. Uh, and um, to, to understand it better, there's a very strong connection with 
uh, Russia being back on the global stage. That's exactly the most direct link that they make. Uh, there, there is a sentiment uh, in all the comments that we, we've been getting that Russia has been oppressed for many years and not just as, uh, since the Soviet Union collapsed but much early in the history uh, and this is finally a reintroduction Russia of world stage becoming a global power, a strong play play on the world stage uh, and most of the comments go personally to President Putin saying that he's, he's the best president Russia has had for years who made this feeling of pride and of identity back to the Russian people. Let's bring in Vladimir there. Do you think personally that it's a price worth paying to have this pride to feel like a global power if there's actually going to be an economic penalty? Uh, definitely there could be some economic penalty, but I am absolutely sure it won't last long and uh, my country won't suffer much of it. Let us remember six, about six years ago uh, there were uh, some event connected uh, with Russia and Georgia. And there, are, uh, also, there were also many talks about sanctions, etc., etc., etc. Uh, time has passed uh, and now uh, nothing remained and we in Moscow again can uh, drink Georgian mineral water and wines. I am absolutely sure that uh, these uh, sanctions announced by some uh, governments also will uh, pass by uh, and uh, we won't suffer much of it uh, because uh, definitely uh, Russia is a huge part of the world and uh, depends on world economy but so does world economy and uh, other countries depending on Russia. We are living in a very interconnected world, so we just have to uh, cooperate whatever happens. Let's pull up this video which came from Kwasi, who is a Ghanaian in London. He sent us this. I think it would be wrong to say anything about the Russian people, whether I have any feeling about the Russian people or not, uh, because uh, this has to do with uh, President Vladimir Putin's own political career, because, uh, you know, you remember that he came to popularity when he launched uh, the war in Chechnya, so he, he has realized that any time his popularity is decreasing, he has to launch a war somewhere to regain uh, the, his popularity, because that he always touches on the nationalist feeling of the Russian people. That's Kwasi who sent us that, who is a Ghanaian in London, sent it via WhatsApp. If you want to do the same, go to facebook.com forward slash world, have you say, all of the details are there. Let's get a reaction from uh, Natalia Tuzovskaya from BBC Russian. Is that a, a sentiment that you're getting, that this is about President Putin showing his power rather than it being for the benefit of Russians? Is that view out there that you're seeing? Absolutely, uh, and it's uh, very much like a personal connection of people reacting to the events and President Putin himself. You know, they they almost address him, address him directly on our website, saying, Vladimir, you're a great, great guy, thank you so much, regardless actually of the questions that we ask them. So it's, it's all very emotional. But um, there's another trend as well, which I uh, wanted to say and to mention, uh, is that it's also quite anti-Western in a sense. So when they say, Vladimir, you're a great guy, you've beaten the West, you've showed them our power. And it's all very mixed feelings, but they are incredibly strong. Let's bring in Beric now, who joins us from St. Petersburg. He's an IT specialist there. Beric, welcome to World Have Your Say. How do you feel as a Russian looking at what's happened over the last week? Do you, do you feel this pride that we've been talking about? Sure, I do. Uh, not only me. Uh, today, Putin has signed the law, constitutional law, about uh, Crimea uh, accession. So you're feeling the pride that President Putin has signed that deal today to, to bring Crimea into the Russian Federation. Katya is in St. Petersburg but comes from Sevastopol in Crimea. What's your take on this, Katya? Uh, we are absolutely happy, my family, um, me here and my family in Sevastopol. And we are proud of our country, of Russia and of Crimea and Crimean citizens. What about this worry that we've been talking about, the economic impact, people talking about the sanctions, how it's going to hit hard? Do you think that as the pride disappears over the coming months, the reality of, of hard-hitting sanctions could change people's views? Well, Russian 
people struggled heavily in uh, many wars and uh, uh, towards many things. So um, I, I'm sure uh, that uh, pride will not disappear. And uh, speaking about uh, um, economic future for Crimea, I'm pretty sure that uh, being with Russia is much better than uh, being some vague uh, future with uh, uh, Europe. Uh, I, I do not mind uh, being in a good relationship with uh, uh, Europe, but uh, uh, for Ukraine, uh, that's only for Western regions of Ukraine was much better uh, to be with the United uh, uh, European Union. Barak, do you agree that it's a price worth paying? Sorry? Yes, I do. Uh, this is the Russian land. Uh, this is Russian people. Uh, they want to be part of Russia. And uh, temporary economical sanctions will not change anything. Natalia, um, you're still with us. Um, what would you say to Beric and, and Katia what, as you listen to them talking about this pride and it being a price worth paying? Well, they sound like, I can't see them, but, but they sound like young people. Um, it's shocking to me that uh, the concept of freedom for those people probably doesn't mean very much. Because another price to pay for what's going on is the, 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 the little shreds of freedom that Russia still had. I don't know if those guys know anything about the crackdown on the last three uh, media outlets. Uh, uh, that has been happening literally within the last couple of weeks. The last... Uh, 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 the uh, networks on um, internet that uh, really were, you know, p portraying things as they are uh, uncensored, uh, as well as TV station called Rain. Um, I am the member of the opposition. I'll tell you what happened to me last few days, a uh, few days ago, rather, when I was flying into Moscow from uh, from the U.S., where I was just for one week on a, on, a, on a visit. I was detained on the border, just for being the member of the opposition for a few hours. When while well, they for, this is completely unconstitutional, but they were checking my documents, is what they said. There was there was no explanation. There was nothing. Eventually, I was allowed to cross the border and get and finally get into my own country. Finally, come into my own country. But uh, this is going to be happening um, more and more, and there's going to be a real crackdown on the opposition, which is a complete violation of, of course, democracy and freedom as we we all uh, know it and believe it should be. So this is the price that Russian, young Russian, will have to pay. That uh, the Iron Curtain will come down. It will be a full-blown dictatorship. Russia will be in isolation, and uh, and all the beautiful things that come with that. So um, it's unfortunate that young people don't understand that. They only sort of see and feel in the moment, and they really should. They should analyze a little bit further and a little bit deeper. Well, Natalia, as you talk, I can see Katia smiling. Do you speak to Natalia, Katia? Well, but um, maybe I sound uh, quite young, but uh, if to speak about uh, my parents, uh, who are much older than me, and they are in the, their late uh, 40s, early 50s. Uh, probably they understand more. And um, uh, parents uh, of my husband who live uh, in, and work in St. Petersburg and who are uh, Crimean Ukrainians. This doesn't mean and, anything, uh, unfortunately. They are, they are not afraid of uh, uh, economical sanctions and uh, uh, they work for uh, big uh, companies, actually, and travel a lot. I, I, they probably still don't understand the scope. With all due respect, they probably don't get it. And you will all get it, guys, very soon. And unfortunately, it will be too late. And all this euphoria that's happening right now will, will, die, out, will die off, it will disappear. And all we'll be left with is being, being an outcast in the world. In a, in a global world where, you know, we all like to travel, we all like to trade, we all like to do things together. We should be doing things together. And, and this time and age, Putin is dragging us back into the Soviet Union, away from the civil world, away from, from proper connections and relationships, and into the, into the Cold War. Do you understand what Cold War means? Do you? I mean, really? I don't think people do. I think people forgot. Well, they will soon remember, unfortunately. And, uh, As you're speaking, Natalia, people are getting in touch with us from all around the world. And this question has come in for Katia Jasur in Azerbaijan says, how can Russians be proud that they've invaded and taken part of another country? What would you say to Jasur? 
Katia, what would you say to Jusser? Ah, you speak to me, sorry. That's okay. Uh, Mm, could you repeat your question? Yeah, just as said, how can Russians be proud that they've invaded and taken another country? Uh, they are not invaded, they were defended. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, another thing that Russia didn't have any other choice. Uh, Russia had to, to defend uh, uh, Crimea. Because uh, I, I hope uh, uh, that uh, Europe and uh, the whole West knows about uh, aggression from uh, the Ukrainian neo-Nazi towards Russian people living in Ukraine. Katia, Beric and Natalia, do stay with us here on World Have Your Say. I understand that lots of you are picking up the phone and getting in touch with us here at World Have Your Say. We'll bring as many of your comments to you as we can over the next few minutes. Do stay with us. No, I, I, I absolutely talking about it. Yeah, oh, let me say something. No, I, I, I absolutely talking about it. Yeah, oh, let me say something. Welcome back to World Have Your Say. We're joined by a group of Russians who are discussing the situation in Crimea. Are they proud to be Russian at the moment? Are they proud of what President Putin has done? Many of you getting in touch with us from Tanzania, Saudi Arabia, Uganda, Croatia, India, South Africa, Zimbabwe and here in the UK. Do keep your comments coming in to us. First of all, I want to pull up this video which was sent to us from Crimea. I'm Kirill from Yalta in Crimea. Here we say that the Russian spring has arrived. We are free from the Ukrainian occupation. Now we can speak the language we want to speak and feel at home. The most important thing is that this has happened without a single gunshot. We just chose to be with Russia. Crimeans always spoke Russian and considered themselves Russian. We never belong to Ukraine. Russia is the choice we made. Well, that was Kirill from Uganda. And this is how Kamya, sorry, Kirill in um, Crimea, apologies. Um, but this is how uh, Kamya in Uganda answered a question which we put up on our Facebook page of how do you feel about Russia? His response was that Russia is a great nation which can save us from the world destroyers, which are NATO. Let's put that point to our guests who are still with us. Anissa Noe is a senior political correspondent for RT, better known as Russia Today. She is with us from Moscow. Katia is in St. Petersburg but comes from Sevastopol in Crimea and Natalia Pelovina is co-founder of the 5th of December Opposition Political Party and is in Moscow. Anissa, first of all, responding to that point we got there on Facebook, is this about President Putin flexing his muscle, pushing against the West and saying, I am a strong leader, don't mess with Russia? No, I think this is about the Russian people and President Putin doing what he's meant to do, which is to protect the country's interest. Um, and it's an answer, of course, to the West. Like I said, you can't separate what happened uh, in Kiev with the referendum in Crimea. And uh, like you heard from many of the Russians that you're speaking to, uh, what would have been the reaction from Russians if Putin had done nothing? It would have been a horrible reaction. Uh, his ratings now have gone up. Do I think he did it because he's a politician and he wants good ratings? No, I think he did it because he is meant to protect Russian people. And the population in Crimea is mostly Russian. And what the first thing the illegitimate government in Kyiv started to do was to threaten their rights and the right to autonomy in Crimea. Briefly, Katya, would you respond? Yes, I am uh, absolutely agree that uh, uh, the 60% uh, of Crimea are Russians and even Ukrainians who live on the territory of Crimea, they speak Russian and uh, associate themselves with Russia only. Not so they associate Ukraine. with Russia and they want that connection. Thank you all of my guests for joining me here on World Have You Say. That's all we've got time for, but you can switch over to our radio edition on the BBC World Service in just a couple of hours time where they're going to be discussing discussing what stands in the way of gender equality. Thanks for watching.